Well, thanks, Tim. It is uh, great to have you all with us for the second instalment of Five Years From Now. Uh, last week, Mike talked about growing and some of the traits thereof, faith, love, bearing fruit, endurance, patience and joy, being some of the advantages of being in a growth cycle. This bears out not only individually but as a community. Mike finished with the idea of growth being generated by saturation in the word and that indelible image of little Nora, his daughter, reciting the Arionic blessing indicates for us that saturation comes long before maturation. You've got to soak yourself in the word if you hope to grow yourself in the word. And how are we going with that? If I'm to run a pop quiz uh, as to how many of us have actually read the Bible cover to cover, uh, you can even listen to it nowadays, I wonder how many people would be able to put their hands up. And if I were to ask how many of us have allowed the Bible to read us, how many of us would put our hands up? Hebrews 4 does more than insinuate that the Word of God can powerfully shape us, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, it doesn't stop there either. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes to, of him to whom we must give account. So the word of God isn't just powerful in rebuking and correcting us, in growing uh, us and maturing us. One day, we'll be held to account for what we do with it. If I was to ask you how, uh, right now, how many of us are in the word daily, for instance? I wonder what the response might be. Having said that, guilt and fear are motivators, but they're not very good ones, are they? And just in case you're wondering, this question uh, about reading the Bible daily isn't actually about guilt or fear. It's about drift and about keeping ourselves anchored in a world that is fast-paced and ever-changing and has very little as a mainstay. Inclusive. The value that we're looking at today is probably the most vulnerable and easily misunderstood of all of our values. The Cambridge Dictionary gives us this meaning for inclusivity. Uh, the fact of including all types of people, things or ideas and treating them all fairly and equally. Apart from anything else, I don't think this definition passes the pub test. Whilst we might believe that all people are equal, no one in their right mind believes all ideas are equal. I might love you and value you as a human being and still think your ideas are wacky or even appalling. I might love you and value you as a human being, but if you're, a, say, a neo-Nazi, part of my love for you is going to be my opposition to your ideas. All people are equal all ideas are not, but it's the lie we're being sold. Your truth and my truth are equally valid, no matter what my truth is or your truth is. Nowadays, if you speak out against my truth, I can call you bigoted and name your disagreement with me as hate speech. As a Christian, there's only one truth, and it doesn't belong to you or me. In fact, Jesus is pretty clear on it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Jesus' estimation, it's only one source of truth, and it's not you, and it's not me. Interestingly, Jesus, the living embodiment of truth, was also the living embodiment of love and of being inclusive. Jesus treated all people with dignity and respect. He did not treat ideas like that. In fact, it could be reasonably argued that his ferocious disagreement with some of the ideas floating around in his times 
was actually what got him crucified. What fascinates me, though, is that Jesus, the Son of God, the Saviour, the way, the truth, and the life, seem to be remarkably adept at walking the line between truth and love. So in Jesus Christ, the most inclusive person who ever walked the face of the planet is also the person who is the most morally upright. This God-man who lifts a bar on sin, who says, if you lust, you may as well have committed adultery. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. The same one who calls out greed and self-indulgence is the very same person who loves the unlovable, who speaks of the Father's love for the unworthy, and who greets, hangs out with, forgives, and befriends the most outrageously immoral people of his day. Jesus is inclusive without being permissive. He calls sin out without being mean. In the Gospel of John, when a woman's caught in adultery and she's brought before him, Jesus finds a way to give her dignity. And he says, has anyone condemned you? She says, no, neither do I condemn you. But he doesn't just leave it there. He invites her to something new. Now go and leave your life of sin. Jesus models truth and love. And he calls us to do the same. When I read the Gospels, I get the sense that with Jesus, the door is always open. No one's excluded from coming to him. The invitation is actually to all. How does he do it? How does Jesus keep his morals and holiness intact whilst immersing himself in the immoral and unholy world around him? How does he remain inclusive with people whilst disagreeing with their ideas? When we put inclusive up as one of SBC's church values, we did it because it was a great descriptor of what a community that follows Jesus should look like. I'd love to say that we are where we need to be on this, but I reckon we've got some work to do. I don't know about you, but I would love for Sindel to be a safe and loving place to bring anyone. And when I say anyone, I mean anyone. A place that's biblically sound and welcoming of anybody who walks through its doors. But again, the question is, How do we become that? How do we lovingly embrace the world around us and keep Jesus front and centre of our lives? The Apostle Paul is probably the best uh, scriptural example we have of how to do that other than Jesus as a leader of the mission to the godless Gentiles. And let me say that the kinds of people and situations and societies that Paul was dealing with makes ours look like the most moral and upright society that ever graced the planet. Uh, He was dealing with some full-on stuff. Uh, And yet, uh, Paul seems to be able to embrace people of many kinds without embracing all their ideas. Somehow, Paul seems to be able to discern what's permissible and what is not amongst the morass of his societal norms. So in Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul gives us a few tips as to how to walk this tightrope. The tightrope between embracing all cultures without embracing all their ideas. This morning we're going to have a quick look under the bonnet with Paul and we're going to see how we might become more like Jesus in our inclusivity. But before we do that, let's ask God to open our hearts and minds to what he might want to say to us. Let's pray together. Lord, I ask that as we open your word together and as we think on these things, as we think on how to be a more inclusive people, I ask God that you'd speak to us where we're at. Whatever side of the tightrope we fall on, I ask God that you might speak to us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Of all the different areas that I've had to learn humility in, and there's quite a few, uh, I must admit that parenting is the great leveller. A lot of theories going around about how to be 
the most awesome parent, but I must admit, I thought we had the brief pretty well nailed when we had our first child, Lachlan. Uh, Lachlan was a little cherub of a baby, and apart from being very cute and relaxed as a baby, he was incredibly compliant. Mummy, can I have a lollipop? Uh, not today, my love, and that would be the end of it. Uh, needless to say, whenever I would see kids lying on the floor of the supermarket screaming and kicking, I'm ashamed to admit that I would think to myself smugly, clearly a parenting problem. <laughs> then we had Emily, and some, same parents, different child, and for the first four years of her life, Emily just would not take no for an answer. And much to my horror, we were the hapless parents with the kid lying on the floor of Coles, screaming at the top of her voice, I want a lollipop! You know what, there's nothing like standing in the other person's shoes to promote understanding and empathy, is there? Uh, one of the great obstacles to being inclusive, I think, is our lack of ability to see from another person's perspective. Stephen Covey says it well in Habit 5 of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he says, seek first to understand and then to be understood. The Apostle Paul is much more radical and uh, encompasses the cost of doing this in his statement. He says, though I am free and I belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. It's a radical statement. And one of the inherent difficulties of being inclusive is that it requires us to adopt a posture of service to others. Being inclusive as a community of Jesus followers actually means we adopt a posture of service. Paul's language, uh, we become a slave to everyone as to win as many as possible. Have a think about this. What if the community of God's people, as a community of God's people, we decided that regardless of whether we're on the welcoming team or not, we would make it our business to make sure that no one got in or out of the building without being served, without being greeted, without being loved. Whether it's helping a parent to find tribe, making a space for someone in a wheelchair, pushing ourselves to engage and bless anybody who comes in, old, new, no matter how they're dressed or what their appearance been challenged of late to start thinking about our infrastructure even here at Sindel and how we need to do more work to make our buildings more accessible to those who are not able-bodied. Things like more than one working lift, more accessible stages, car parking. In order to be inclusive, we need to see through other people's eyes and we need, we've got lots more work to do on that. On the brighter side, some of the feedback that I've received is that we've improved at making newcomers welcome, but does that make us inclusive? What about people who've been around for a while? Do we go out of our way to look for people who are on the margins, who are by themselves? When we chat to our friends after the service, which it's good to chat with friends, but do we invite others, those on the margins, into our conversations? When we come to church with service in mind, we find ourselves always on the lookout for the lonely, for the isolated. We ask ourselves, what would it feel like to be in a room full of people but feel alone? And we make it our business to make sure that no one has that experience here. But it requires a del deliberate mindset of a servant to do that. It requires that we put ourselves in the shoes of others, see what they see, feel what they feel. So being a slave to all is what Paul does, but Paul actually also tells us why he does it. He said, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So Paul's not just inclusive for the sake of it. He's not making himself a slave to everyone so that people will admire his all-round niceness. He's not making himself a slave to everyone. He's making himself a slave to everyone in order to win as many people as possible to Jesus. Paul's ruthlessly 
focused on his goal throughout his ministry years. But it needs to, to be said that this didn't win him the popular vote. He's beaten, stoned, whipped, imprisoned, ultimately martyred for his goal of introducing as many people as possible to Jesus. So whatever you do, don't mistake Paul's quest to serve humanity as a quest for popularity. It's not. He makes himself a slave to all in order to present Jesus to them in word and in deed. Paul wins a lot of people to Christ. But it needs to be said, along the way, he makes a lot of enemies too. Let's see why. To the Jews, he says, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, although I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. So when Paul speaks of the law here, he speaks about the rules of Scripture and the traditions of his fellow Jews. Some of it he could go with, some of it he couldn't. And there are other sections of Paul's writings where he talks about the specifics of this. So you can look that up in your own time. What foods are clean and unclean, the rules of Sabbath and rest, uh, where we should go and where we shouldn't go, and all sorts of other issues that Paul talks about. Some years ago when I was in Indonesia, we were invited into a mosque and we were encouraged at the, uh, at the entrance of the mosque to take off our shoes as we entered the forecourt. Also, even though the weather was hot and humid, we were encouraged to wear long pants and long sleeve shirts in public to avoid unnecessary offence. None of these rules applied to our own Western understanding of things. Our faith makes no such demands. But it would have been disrespectful to the locals not to comply. We became like those under their particular religious laws, to win those under the, those laws. And it doesn't just go one way for Paul. Just in case we're wondering, Paul goes a step further to help us understand his posture of being inclusive with purpose. He goes a step further, and I think for most of us, this is the one that creates the most tension. To those not having the law... I became like one not having the law, although I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. So Paul's context, he's talking about the Gentiles, or people who are not schooled in Jewish religion and or rules. So up until Jesus, these people were untouchable. You actually weren't allowed to go near them, and a God-fearing Jewish person was forbidden for, uh, with, uh, from associating with them. Like Jesus, Paul not only associates with them, but in some ways he becomes like them. He eats their food. He helps them work out what's necessary and what's not to follow Jesus. Does this mean that Paul's some kind of religious chameleon that just becomes exactly whatever societal group he's involved with or hanging out with? No. See, the caveat he puts into both categories, for the religious crowd, he becomes religious to a point. He still doesn't run by all of their rules. For the irreligious, he becomes irreligious to a point. But he still acknowledges that whilst he might not be under the religious rules, he's under Christ's law. So even though Paul's free to adjust his behaviour as he moves from one group to another to be inclusive of them, it doesn't mean that he can do whatever he likes, whenever he likes. When I was in the metallurgy section of the State Electricity Commission many years ago, I walked on, worked on many platforms a long way above the ground. Not a great job for people who suffer with vertigo. Uh, smokestacks were the most interesting and uh, they're a long way above the ground. And most of the smokestacks that I worked on had ladders that went up the outside of them, sort of like this one here in the photo. Uh, to make matters worse, on smokestacks, if the wind is up, the closer you get to the top, the more you can feel them swaying in the breeze. So in a big breeze, uh, the really big smokestacks at Luoyang uh, apparently swing about six metres uh, up the top there. And you can feel it, I'm telling you. They're built to flex in the wind. 
So I'm not going to lie, it was pretty unnerving the first few times uh, I did it. Even though there was a cage of sorts on the ladder to stop you plummeting to your death, the first few times I climbed them, my arms and legs were chock full of lactic acid and very, very sore. Because uh, initially, I was hanging on for grim death uh, as I climbed up. Even though physically I was quite safe, it did not feel that way. Uh, But you'd be surprised how quickly you get used to it. So when you're up on those heights, believe it or not, after a while, you barely notice the height. And the view is spectacular. On most of these jobs, they would make us wear these ridiculous uh, safety vests, uh, a bit like this. Uh, Ours were a lot clumsier than this and had a retractable wire on the back of them that slowed you down the further you moved away from it. And so initially, I was pretty keen to dispense of it and was informed pretty sharply by my supervisor that it was compulsory to wear it. And apparently, once you've been working at heights for a while, you become desensitised. And there are a number of incidents worldwide where people have just simply walked straight off the edge because they weren't watching where they were going. Uh, So I actually almost did it myself when I was testing some handrails in your lawn W station, nine floors up. Uh, and didn't have a safety harness on. I thought it was a pain in the backside, so I ditched that. And fortunately, I looked down at just the right moment, just before I stepped off the edge, and I literally had to sit down afterwards. It made me go weak in the legs. It gave me such a fright. Needless to say, uh, I began to wear my harness and stop complaining about it. What I realised was that the safety harness, however annoying, enable me to go right up to the edge without going over it. And when we look at Jesus and Paul, we find that pretty well in every endeavour, the word of God is what keeps them anchored. When Jesus resists religious bigotry, he does it with the word of God. When he rebukes sin, he does it with the word of God. When he resists the temptations of Satan himself, he does so with the word of God. Jesus is inclusive without being permissive. And even though he's the embodiment of love and grace, he calls sin out without being mean. Jesus models truth and love, and he calls us to do the same. So I get the sense that with Jesus, the door's always open, no one's excluded from coming to him, and the invitation is to all. And as is his custom, Paul seeks to follow Jesus, not only in his being inclusive, but also in being anchored by the word of God. <clears throat> I am not, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to try that on with me. We're going to say it together. Let's say it out loud on three. One, two, three. I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law. So that's, that's how we are. We get to operate freely, but we are actually, actually subject to the word of God. If we're seeking to following, follow Jesus and seeking to reach beyond our comfort zone, we need Paul's safety rope to do it. And on that, a little question to ponder. How familiar am I with God's word? If God's word is a safety rope, am I even attached to it? When I go into the homicide and other squads in my chaplaincy role, I don't expect the people I'm connecting with to have the same values as me. But nor do I change my code of conduct or my beliefs uh, to be in that place. My estimation is that the greatest contribution I can make is an unwavering commitment to Jesus and his call on my life and an unwavering, equally, an unwavering commitment to the officers and their well-being. The two go hand in hand. If I remove either one, I become useless pretty quickly in that environment. I think one of the most difficult issues for us as a church as we seek to be inclusive in this era is to walk the tightrope between truth and love. I know too many Christians who've become 
indistinguishable from the world around them because they're inclusive, but they're not anchored in the Word. In Ephesians 4, Paul describes them as infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there. The other kind that I've seen are those Christians who never venture beyond the comfort of the church and think that they're strong in the word, but it's mostly because they've never allowed their interpretation of the word to actually be road tested. The Pharisees were one of the most God-fearing but exclusive people of Jesus' day, and Jesus condemned them for it. Look at what he says to them. Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who those enter who are trying to. So sometimes the ideas of the world are toxic and lead us astray, but equally problematic. Sometimes our interpretation of scripture and the self-righteous attitudes that come with it are toxic and lead us astray. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be loving of every human being. No matter what, Jesus even calls us to love our enemies and pray for those who hate us. On this basis, a church who proclaims to follow Jesus should be the most open-hearted and accepting community on the face of the planet. But that's not how we're known, is it? It could be that some of us in our desire to follow Jesus and live in obedience to him, that we've fallen into judgmentalism and hypocrisy, where, unlike Jesus, we make theological demands on people who don't even know him, much less follow him. Being inclusive in a scriptural sense is about loving a person where they're at, no matter what their ideas about the world might be. This summer, I purchased a pair of slides, um, and to my delight, they're marvellous, to my delight, uh, these slides were not only super comfortable, but they came with a bottle opener on the bottom of each slide. (laughs) Hey? How about that? I thought I'd hit the jackpot, I kid you not. And uh, I I thought, what an ingenious idea. I could be the most popular person at the barbecue, the perfect footwear for the barbecue at the beach, left-handed and right-handed. Each one had one. It was amazing. It's pretty chuffed until I showed one of my mates and he said, uh, and said, happy to open your bottles any time. And I showed him the bottom of my slide. And uh, he looked horrified and he said, well, I don't know where you've worn them, to be honest. Uh, who knows what you've stood in? And I'm going, ooh. Uh, Maybe you've just come from a public toilet. Now you want to open a bottle that I'm going to put my mouth on. (laughs) Um, No thanks, he said. Um, Let me open your bottle. Would you like salmonella with that? You know? Uh, We all had a bit of a laugh about who came up with the idea, whose ingenious idea it is. Contrary to popular belief, not every idea is a good idea. Let's keep that in mind. We need to get over the thinking that in order to be friends with the world, we need to agree with every idea that the world comes up with. We also need to get over the idea that Christians have always had great ideas. You know? Who thought that burning people at the stake was a good idea? Whose idea was it to have a war between the Protestants and Catholics in Ireland? or to kill Muslims who refuse baptism in the Middle East. I think we might say that whoever thought of those ideas probably didn't get them from Jesus. All of us are susceptible to bad ideas. Like Jesus, Paul seemed to be the master at staying on game, distancing himself from bad ideas all the while, hanging out with people who were utterly different to him, morally, spiritually, and sociologically. Far from being a wishy-washy, beige person who agreed with every idea that came along. Paul was a follower of Jesus, 
who seem to be able to hang out with everyone without buying all their ideas. His willingness to stand up and be counted for his faith is very, very well documented, beaten, enslaved, lashed, betrayed, stoned, ultimately killed for his willingness to stand against the flow. So Paul is a picture of being inclusive without being permissive. And the secret to his success in walking the inclusive without permissive tightrope is his focus as found toward the end of today's passage. To the weak, I became weak to win those who are weak. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Paul's entire life focus is on the life-changing message of Jesus, both living it for himself and inviting others to do the same. Only one question to ask as we finish out today's message. What's yours? What's your life focus? Seriously. When you go to work, what's your focus? Living to please Jesus and share the reason for the hope that you have? Or something else? In your friendships and in your family, what's your focus? Being inclusive or living to please Jesus and share the reason for the hope that you have. Without Jesus, inclusivity can easily default to people-pleasing and biblical literacy can become modern-day Pharisaism. Without Jesus, church just becomes another meeting. And without Jesus, faith is just rules and meaningless religion. You're here this morning in your conversations with one another and with anyone you engage with. What is your focus? Living to please Jesus and share the reason for or something else. Over the Christmas holidays, I read a book called Dominion by a secular historian called Tom Holland. And even though he's not a Christian, he suggests that Jesus, by far and away, is the most transformative force that have ever walked the face of the planet. Without Jesus, we do not have human rights. Without Jesus, we don't have service and sacrifice. We do not have any concern for the poor or the vulnerable. And those who follow Jesus, the transformation is much, much more. It's true that Jesus changed the world forever. But has he changed yours? What's your focus? Living to please Jesus and share the reason for the hope that you have or something else. Wouldn't it be awesome if five years from now, SBC was such a Christ presence in our community that people of every kind could not stay away? Wouldn't it be great If we were so focused on Jesus and his transformative presence that no matter where we went, we were compelled to share him. Wouldn't it be something if in word and in deed and our love for Christ was only equaled by our love for people of every kind and every persuasion? I wonder what it would look like if five years from now we were anchored to scripture, but like Paul, open to anyone who God brought into our lives. Let's ask for that together now. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that you are the initiator. That whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now, Lord, we ask you to give us that same compassion and mercy for all the people you bring into our reach. And now in the quietness of your heart, why don't you bring those in your world before God? The easy people and the difficult people, 
your neighbours, your friends, your work colleagues, your family, those on the margins. Bring them to your mind. And now ask for the compassion and wisdom of Jesus and the courage and conviction of Paul in reaching out to them. Lord, we ask that you would heal our hearts, make them clean. Open up our eyes to those things unseen. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. And enable us to give our all for your kingdom's cause. Lord, give us the compassion of Jesus and the discipline of Paul. Teach us to walk the tightrope between truth and love. In Jesus' name, amen.